Here we go. Good evening, everyone. You're listening to Chase Elements Radio. And um, it's Wednesday. We made it. We made it to Wednesday. This is a good thing. We're going to be talking about rituals. Some of my favorite ones because they involve sex and violence, which is just perfect because we like that. We like it a lot. We like our demons like we like our coffee, hot and bitter. But don't worry, for the people who don't like the bitterness, we have fat and sugar, just like our fake foods. So you can totally ignore the fact that you kind of don't like it, but you want it anyway. So let's dive in. We are now in April, and this is what we're going to talk about today. April, very important to me. This is my month. My birthday's on the 8th. I'm very excited about that. This is the month where everything wakes up. This is fertile, fertile ground for all of us. The jingling of bells during the dance is meant to frighten evil spirits. The clashing of sticks represent the fight between good and evil still ongoing. The dancer who weaves in and out of the team of dancers is known as the fool. And whilst his dance seems to be kind of of a random nature, in fact, his dance is very intricate and represents the nativity of man and the naivete of man. The dancer who is dressed as an animal character shows man reliance on nature. Handkerchiefs emphasize the hand movements during this dance that happens in April. Crop fertility rites. These two are very ancient, very strange things. Crop fertility rites have been practiced since ever, most likely, way before pagan times, since we grew anything, I'm sure. And the first time we looked outside and saw that the world was not coming to an end and the plants were being woken. These take many forms. Of course, we're going to talk about the later rituals, like was sailing, maypole dancing, cheese rolling, well dressing, all of these carried out in most regions of the British Isles, but particularly rural areas, was sailing. Its origins lost to the mists of time, carried out by Morris dancers. The dances are to ensure a good fertility of crops, and the dances vary from region to region. Mode of dress also Various. Example, on the cot worlds, the Morris men dress in gray top hats, blue and yellow baldric and armbands, red spotted neckerchiefs, kind of like ascots, I guess, gray cord trousers, blue and yellow ribbons on their bell pads. Their style of dance is called Cots Worlds Morris. The jingling of bells during this dance is meant to frighten evil spirits. And the clashing of sticks represent the fight between good and evil, which is hilarious to me. Do we not need death? Does the earth not die every year? and go under a time of dormancy. Actually, if we did it now, we'd be able to eat every vegetable and it would still be healthy. Allowing the land to go fallow, this is death. And then, after death, comes life. You can only have life if there's a death. Only. This good and evil that we have been forced to believe it's just a cycle of life. There is no good. There is no evil. 
There is no light magic. There is no dark magic. Well, now, now there kind of is. But then again, I think what most people have forgotten is what they're worshipping now. It's kind of closer to the demon from the exorcist. You're all worshipping Pazuzu, which makes me laugh a little bit when you guys write these little horrific things about each other's religion and you're worshipping the same demon. You're worshipping a demon. Because read the books, they're pretty nasty, even with the nice um, safe space kind of stuff that we hear now. This is not a good guy. He's a little rapey and... Um, Pedo. But I guess um, we kind of like that. Maybe we just like to be scared. Either way, this is what's going on right now. The dance, again, the dancer weaves in and out of a team of dancers known as the Fool. And whilst he dances, it seems to be completely random. You can't even tell. It is intricate. It is precise. It represents naivete. And the nativity. This must be brought by a man. Sorry, guys. There are little ideas of girls only club. No, a man must bring this. The dancer who is dressed as an animal usually goes through, and this dance is done everywhere, how we spring up from life. It must be a, a man to perform this dance. Beautiful. Handkerchiefs. Just emphasizing the beautiful movements of his hands. We can still see this. We have Border Morris dancing. It differs very much in style. The dance is more vigorous. Style of dress differs. If you go to Ledbury in Herefordshire, is that the word? They have their faces black. Their headgear is the black bowler hats. This is the black top hat. This is the black trousers. This is a white shirt with stripes, colored, sewn rags weaved in it, colored sash, matching ribbons, a bowler hat. Around the knees, bells are attached, a pair of boots to con complete the ensemble. This is once again our dark hero wearing the black. This isn't about white guys or black guys. This is the black. This is the nighttime. This is the winter. There must be darkness. And then comes in the light. You get this together, and we would have a good earth, but people act like they're in high school, which was a horrific time for me, myself, personally, where people just learn to be cruel to each other. And this is what I'm seeing on Facebook and most websites right now. People have only learned how to argue and snipe at each other like little bitches. Sorry, but that's how you are, because girls are really, really nasty. Do you remember high school? Really nasty. And it's all because of the sexual pressure, too, and we want the best man, and this is just the way we are. Violent. Nasty. We hunt. This is the time of the hunting, so expect a little Poltergasm activity, and I have to thank everyone who responded to my uh, search for the deadly chicken, which I did not give into. By the way, for those who want to know, I did not partake of the um, feather dragon this year. It was very close, and it was beautiful for the people who sent me messages who wanted to know, negotiate some terms for my uh, defilement. It's awesome. <laughs> I did not, but it was very sweet, and some of our most enlightened men were the ones who have the dirtiest minds, which I I value this. You guys are dirty, 
It's awesome. So if you would like to send me any kind of suggestions, <laughs> please go to Trace Elements Radio where I will listen to your little filthy, filthy minds. Spankings all around. Anyway. We have the Cradley, Cradley Morris men, usually accompanied by other dancers at Christmas time, same place. They perform them regularly. The dress is not, well, it's actually the most colorful. It's characters dress in multicolored rags, covered trousers, hat, coat. It weighs about 30 friggin' pounds, so it's heavy. Regular venue of theirs is at the Slip Tavern, much uh, Marcy. The whale sailing takes place in, in a nearby orchard. Meeting at the pub at Torchlight, awesome. There will be drinking. A procession makes its way to a selected tree with the men leading the way as they should drumming wildly. The procession encircles the selected tree, which goes back to people who've been with me for a while as what we worship first, the sacred tree, the white tree, the big tree. This was our first goddess, which has fires surrounding it. And ceremony takes place, toasted bread, soaked in cinder or cider hangs from the tree branches. Cider is poured on the root of the tree. I love cider. And one of the fires, known actually as Judas fire, is stamped out. And that's, of course, of the religions that were stolen from another place. But anyway, the whale sailing bowl is passed around for all to take a sip. This communal sharing and partying is awesome. A song is sung, a shotgun is fired at the tree to wake it up for the coming ceremony, after which everyone makes their way back to the tavern with the Morris men play and sing folk songs. And again, shooting at the tree, this is again ritual sacrifice, but it's good this time because there's pie. <laughs> And Easter's coming, so we need to do that. This toasted bed and cider sounds pretty good. Usually hung from apple branches. Cider is poured on the root again. Very interesting. Another one is practiced in Brinsop, Herefordshire. Here the men stand in a circle round a fire chanting repeatedly. Old cider, the effect being like more of a dirge, you know, like a funeral dirge. But it's again, it's a solemn time, and and I'm okay with that too. It's the darkness. You got to celebrate the darkness, because without the darkness, there would not be spring. There would not be the awakening. And then we start in the darkness too. So the darkness must be celebrated. We need to embrace our inner darkness without being a-holes to each other. This is the part we got wrong. <laughs> it's actually this effect, this, the effect of the song. I listened to one on, on the weekend to get ready for this. It's, and the cider as well, which is quite strong, and I can't love cider, sit frequently. It's said to cause some sort of hypnosis. So I'm not sure what spices are mixed, and I'm guessing there are, but the men go into a hypnotic state. Then another one, clog dancing practiced mainly in the northwest is regional in style, much more disciplined. However, there are a number of clog dancing groups who visit villages in Midlands area of England. Many of these groups are female, which is wrong. The mode of dress differs greatly from group to group. They are fascinating to watch. The dance has considerable skill, 
but the awakening is supposed to be by the men. It is. It's the men. But the maypole dancing. Now, traditional dance, as the name suggests, is in May. The pole, again, this is the tree. It's usually hawthorn or birch. In 1664, it was banned by an act of parliament because there's probably sex going on and we can't have that. And then we have to revive the the restoration of Charles II, of course. Now, the dance nowadays mainly involves children, which is wonderful because this is a spring. It takes a form, a group, children encircling the pole with ribbons that are attached. Each dancer holds a ribbon. The dance in a circle around the pole by dancing in rotation the ribbons wrap around the pole intricate pattern is formed this is the corn dance that we have natives had here there's always a corn dance this is the scary children of the corn too which there were rituals here now I realize that what we've told you mainly and what you will hear but what went on here pre um our European brothers and sisters coming over, that we were all sitting cross-legged on the ground and it was a happy time. No, there were some pretty dark stuff going on here, too. It seemed to take over the world at the same time because we are a group, and what happens with one group happens with all of them. So when there were a whole things going on over there, they were going on over here. So the dances were pretty... It was interesting. There were interesting times. There was bloodshed. Now, the purpose of the dance, again, is to herald spring, to bring good luck with the crops, and there's nothing like a ritual sacrifice to do that. A number of villages still have a maypole amongst the Welford on Avon area and Warwickshire, Offenham, Worcestershire. And although practiced in many UK, its origin, actually, I th I think it's Germanic. We could say pagan, but I don't want to call it pagan. Then again, mistletoe again. Welsh farmers associated this with fertility and believed that a good crop of, of mistletoe was a harbinger of a good food crop the following year. Now, of course, mistletoe, poison, pretty sure. But anyway, this one I thought was really strange, really, really strange, cheese rolling. Now, each year there's actually a cheese rolling competition. Who even does that? You guys are, you know, off the hook. <laughs> and I dig that about you. On Copper's Hill, um, Brockworth, four miles south of Gloucester. I don't know, it's weird. This ancient competition has its origins going back to possibly the Phoenician period. It may go back further than that and was regarded as a healing ritual. I don't know. But the event involves actually rolling a great big large hunk of cheese down a hill which at some points have an incline of almost straight up and down. So the cheese rollers have to be extremely fit because you're running. The winner is the one who competes the course in the fastest time, probably without killing himself because that would be bad. Popular spectator event is fun. We like to party. We're coming out of our caves. We're reawakening. We're eating again. Because we had just gone through March, which was the, the month of the starving for everyone in the Northern Hemisphere. Because there wasn't much growing. Several thousands gather at the top of the hill, enjoy watching the rough and tumble. Besides the downhill event, there's an uphill event, which takes place between the downhill races. Now, let's get into the fertility Right, and 
bring on the human sacrifice. Now here, we don't do the human sacrifice, but, you know, there's usually some sort of chicken, again, involved. But the chickens, they were freaking pterodactyls or something last time. So, you know, they were a-holes. Anyway, it was on St. Valentine's Day, 1945, that Charles Walton of Lower Quinton left his home, cut the hedges on nearby Meow Hill. Amongst his tools, he had a trousing hook and a hay fork, pitchfork. He failed to return home as usual. Well, at his usual time, his niece who kept the house for him contacted the neighbors and the search began. By torch light, the searchers checked the fields where he had been observed. After a short time, they came upon his body. He had been murdered with his trousing hook, which was still in his throat. He was pinned to the ground with his hay fork. A cross carved into his neck and chest. Blood flowing from the runes soaked the ground surrounding the body. And that's mostly how it was done, that blood had to soak the ground. Murder was never traced, despite intensive investigations. By both the Spooner and Fabian of New Scotland Yard, these two being the most respected police officers of the time, Charles Walton, buried in Churchyard, Lower Quinton, but no trace of his burial place, is now visible as the area now has been landscaped and the headstone removed. It was believed in the Middle Ages that the date was the best day of the year for the blood sacrifice. As at this time, the earth was revitalizing itself from the winter and the ritual sacrifice would ensure a good crop for the upcoming season. Let there be blood. Local superstitions believe this could be the case, or it was just plain murder. It's doubtful whether or not the truth would be known. However, superstitions abound. Spooner referred Fabian to a book, Folklore, Old Costumes and Superstitions, in Shakespeare Land. It was written in 1929 by J. Harvey Bloom, a local vicar. The book told of a weak-minded young man who killed a woman named Ann Turner with a hay fork because he believed that she had bewitched him. Another part of the book mentions that in 1885, a plowboy named James Walton met a black dog. Interesting. On nine six, six, consecutive days so this is again one of the hounds of hell I love it when you can bring all the stories together and whilst returning home from work on the ninth day the dog was in the company of a headless woman legends about black dogs heralding death is again something that we carry around worldwide and forever it's possible that this young man was the same Charles Watton who who met his death so brutally in 1945. Now that's a fast half hour. I will be right back, everyone. I hope you're enjoying the show. Oh, wait a minute. I think I had my mic off again. <laughs> okay, so I'm on. We are going to square the circle now before we go back to Hathor's birthday because that's actually what this is. Sometimes, well, all the time, it's, it seems that the circle theory doesn't go in cycles. And although I haven't read it, I've been following this podcast blog promotion, the compliant class. 
the latest book is one of my favorites, favorite economists anyway, Tyler Cohen. It's interesting to see how much of it overlaps with the analysis of chaos protocols. What is particularly interesting is Tyler is also, well, looking at or resurrecting the verboten economy, the heresy of these cycles. Not only that, but he describes so doing so in a way that got me into cyclic analysis a couple years ago, the biggest story of the last 15 years, both internationally, nationally, globally, wherever you may be, is a growing likelihood of a cyclic model of history that it will be a better predictor than the model of ongoing process because it works, because the data show this much better, is a much better match for our experience other than the 90s Trumpism of Blair Clinton era. Things can only get better, right? <laughs> More than that, Tyler seems to share my own connection, that the future is broad broadly positive, well, eventually. That's the secret cycle model. It lacks the manic interventionism that owes more to American Protestant apocrypha, where you, where you when Jesus returned. Then the underlying supporting groups are rigorous interpretations of what's going on. But all these things right now, this is, the planet is under one world order. Has been for a while. We are still under Rome. We are still worshipping, well, the God. We can call him what you want, but I'm still going for a demon myself. And I'm, I'm not um, blaming you for worshipping this guy. But we have to know that whatever came here first came, kicked off the creation, left. And what was left after were the old ones. Who are still in our mythology? These are, well, they're, they're kind of what we call demons, kind of what we call vampires. Vampires are hybrids. They're human something else. They are part demon, part old ones. But that's for another time. But the overlapping crisis unfolding now in this decade, diminishing returns on skyrocketing debts, demographics of an aging populace, the erosion of a social contract, the profound disunity of political elites will continue expanding and feeding on each other regardless of who or what is in power. He said she isn't in the game. This is the game. There are a few plays. The next few plays are highly predictable. You basically describe your thesis as a glum return to the cyclic view of history. The idea that society's success plants the seeds of its own downfall. In this case, the seed is complacency. There are, again, definitely shadows of Edward Gibbon's history of the decline of fall of Roman Empire. Jubilee is that by taking active steps to reduce complacency, the U.S. can smooth out the cycle of history to prevent collapse, or is your warning merely prophecy of the inevitable doom. I view it as a prophecy, but one of ultimate renewal, because there must be. It may not be us, 
but it must be. And there will not be perpetual doom. There is plenty that we could do to renew this planet. Or these cycles of repeating nations. The American duism, if you like. The economists agree on many, though not all, of these remedies. I just don't see us doing it, however. And I dare suggest that the quantity of the quality of governance worldwide has taken a severe downward turn as of late. Eventually, we will get to a point where Americans who are in control right now will have to take a risk to avoid risk. And that will jog our dynamic and competitive spirits once again because we are nothing if not competitive. The thing is though the path to the affairs of this planet is going to be fairly unpleasant and painful. Still, there's much talent here and in the longer run, I'm going to bet on that talent coming through once again. It's come up a couple times. Is this right? Is that right? It's not immediately obvious how this should be so given the latter deals going on in prediction and the former in the nature shortcomings of predictions. But at second look, they actually align rather well over the notion of time. Here's Taleb's talking on his more famous elaboration of the Lindy effect. There has been a bevy of mathematical models that sort of fit the story. They're not really. The Lindy effect proved to be using a theory of fragility and anti-fragility. Actually, the theory of fragility directly leads to the Lindy effect. Simply, they managed to define fragility as sensitivity to disorder. The porcelain owl sitting in front of me on my writing desk as I am writing wants tranquility. It dislikes shocks. Disorder, variations, earthquakes, mishandling by dust phobic cleaning service operators. <laughs> Travel in suitcases, especially transmitting through term Terminal 5 in something like Heathrow. Shelling in Saudi Barbaria sponsored Islamic militants. Clearly, it has no opposite from random events and more generally disorder. More technically being fragile, it necessarily has a non-linear reaction to stressors. Up until its breaking point, shocks of larger intensity affect it disproportionately than the smaller ones. Now, critically, time is equivalent to disorder and resistance to ravages of time. That is, we gloriously call survival. Is the ability to handle disorder. There will be people to survive this. These are the ones who can tolerate disorder. Is fragile what this asymmetric response to volatility and other stressors, that is, will experience more harm than it will benefit from it. The idea of fragility, helped by some rigor around the notion that only effective judge of things is time. By things, I mean ideas, people, intellectual productions, car models, scientific theories, books, etc. You can't fool Lindy 
books of the type written by current hotshot, op-ed writer, New York Times, may get some hype at publication time, manufactured or spontaneous, but their five-year survival is generally inferior to that of, I don't know, some sort of pancreatic cancer, maybe. The operation of time is necessarily done through the skin in the game. Without skin in the game, via contact with reality, the mechanisms of fragility is disrupted. Things may survive for no reason for a while, then ultimately collapse, causing a lot of side harm. We once again have to go back to the Phenocean ancestors. Might not recognize these things as food or drink. You can logic your way around these things to something very specific, weightlifting regime, if you like, in this quest for, to work out the anti-fragile that we're developing here, a coherent model for the impact of time on us, I guess, space or matter. That which is anti-fragile is that which thrives in the turning of the cycle model. We're looking for things that would make myself anyway, optimistic in the medium term. It brings us back to Armstrong's ECM. It's essentially a shutdown and calculate trading model. The fact that is, it works most of the time has an enormous metaphysical implications here. April, May turning point model swings around the French election suggests Le Pen could win but also times around an ultimate debt ceiling, a showdown if you will, which if it goes as badly as it probably will, may have the same effect on e equalities as vast sums of money fleeing an official, officially over Eurozone. So it's prophecy with minimal speculation. It doesn't purport to know and describe the divine order or the music of the spheres or anything that will make it fall completely out of alignment. However, with a deep analytical knowledge of history we must the impact of time in the search for the way we can best position our lives in relationship to it they're developing ideas, cause and effect, for how we can meta-know things. How we can make decisions with a fuller understanding of complexity and predictability. This particular squaring of the cycles also necessarily suggests rarely best, or rarely considered best practice may sound familiar to most, especially when we start looking at sigils. If you look at New York City, here's the big takeaway, that once you eliminate the chances of destruction, you can and should experiment. Eliminating the chances of destruction might sound close to become invincible. 
Beyond that, it all just comes down to luck, at least in one of my preferred definitions for it. Luck is unpunished naivete. And we should just stand there. Now again, this is the time of the Harlequin. The woman. That abused crazy female from, once again, Gotham City. The calends of April are sacred to Venus. This is the Harlequin. As is the entire month sacred to Venus. And this day, April 1st, has been called venereal, venereala, something like that, public games, lundi, would be held in the honor of this deity. This day is also known as All Fools Day to the Romans. And they would spend the entire day celebrating with comic hilarity, doing things backwards, doing all things backwards. I think Tony and I were talking about that. Wearing women's clothes specifically, not Tony, but other people, dancing in the streets, doing everything in a way that you've never done it before. This is, again, standing in the face of fragility saying, I will not be torn down. Generally, though, carrying on in the most foolish ways, congenial manner, happiness. This was one of the few Roman holidays that has preserved some of its original character under the modern name of April Fools. In Egypt, this happened too. This day was celebrated as a birthday of the goddess Hathor. <laughs> Hathor again. All of these things seem to come come back and forth with us, doesn't it? Now the Anglo Saxons called April Oster Month or Oster Monath. The period sacred to Ostara, Oster, the pagan Saxon goddess of spring, from those whose name was derived from modern Easter. Now, it's probably no coincidence that April Fool's Day is celebrated at the same time that two other similar holidays are celebrated, ancient Rome festival of Hilaria, the Sardequin, was thrown to celebrate the resurrection of the god Attis. Hilaria is probably a base for the word hilarity and hilarious, which meant great merriment. Today, Hilaria is also known as the Roman Laughing Day. Now, in a tribute to Attis, the priests of Sybil, known as Galli or Galloi, would castrate themselves, believe it or not, and dress as women, because they might as well at this point. What's interesting about it, this castration, was because they were following the Hittites. This is where circumcision which we've watered down to say is just the little clipping of skin. No, it was castration. We'll come back. God, it's past half hours, you guys. I must be feeling better. We'll return in a little while. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for listening today. For people who are new to Trace Elements Radio, I, I'm very pleased that you're listening to me on Revolution Radio today. Thank you very much. And if you have time, come to TraceElementsRadio.com and come and take a look at what I got. I, I think you'll like it. Anyway, this is one of the one of the big losses for the Bible. I think, 
personally because we are talking about Hathor. Hathor is one of the old ones. So Hathor is not male, nor was Hathor female. Hathor was both, the combined being. This is some of the stuff that luckily, well, some, some of the religions still kept it in. Um, Islam talked about the old ones. They called them jinn, but these are the combined beings. Not good, not bad. Do they come and visit us? Perhaps, but they were the ones here before us. They were the old ones. These are Cthulhu. These are the ancients. So, the priests of Sipple, the Galloi, running around all castrated and stuff. This was to represent her. Could have done another way, but I'm not judging. They would travel around the countryside, perform wild musical rituals to the Great Mother, just as Attis did. So this is what you're performing up in uh, England and the rest of the world. And most likely here, too. We're probably performing this. Now, ancient histories have very various opinions on the Galois, from admiration to amusement to ridicule to hostility. But everyone seemed to agree that the Galois love to kick it up. <laughs> Their rituals and festivals made Woodstock look like a ladies' club luncheon. They had fun. They were wild. They were, again, drunken in their dancing. They were celebrating. This was the ritual of fun. This was before fun was beaten out of us. Uh, the Kaloi made appearances also at um, a Pollucius Metamorphosis, a classic Roman comic novel. The story concerns an amateur sorcerer named Lucius, who mucks up a spell, turns himself into a donkey. Lucius is then sold to a wandering band of Kaloi and dragged around while their priests travel the countryside, performing their acts door to door. Now, obviously, not a fan. Lucius describes the Galois rites, which include eerily exact precursor to heavy metal headbanging. Two dog would love this. They arrived at a rich man's villa and screeching their tuneless songs. From the moment they saw the gates, they rushed frantically inside, bending their heads. They twisted, writhed, rolled their necks to and fro, while their long hair swung in circles. The secret history of rock and roll starts there. Boys and girls. Now, the local legend about Attis is this. Zeus... It is said, let him fall in his sleep, seed onto the ground, which in the course of time became a daemon. A daemon. So again, we're going back to Islamic tales. The daemons are the jinn, the fairies in the bottle. These daemon had two sexual organs, both male and female. They are the old ones. They called this first daemon Agditus. But the gods, fearing this Agditus, cut off the male portion. There he grew up from it, from the cut-off organ, an almond tree with its ripe fruit and the daughter of a river, Sigarius, or Sang, Sangarius, sounds like blood, they say, took the fruit, laid it on her bosom, and at once it disappeared, and she was with child. A boy was born and exposed, but 
he was a goat, a male goat. Interesting. So as he grew up, his beauty was more than human. And Egdidas fell in love with him. This again is Sybil or Kaibel, depending on who you talk to. Now, when he grew up, he was sent to his relatives in the city in Pessens. He was supposed to wed the king's daughter. The marriage song was being sung. It did disappear. Atis went crazy, cut off genitals. There's a lot of genital cutting in, in these stories. I don't know why. They're cutting everybody up. But, you know, the Romans, okay? <laughs> who also in love with this guy, but he was giving him to his daughter in marriage. But Adidas repented of what she had done to Attis and persuaded Zeus to grant the body of Attis that it should never rot, nor should it decay. These are the most popular legends of Attis. I know, really strange. And if you go to my site, there are pictures and everything. Trace Elements Radio. So when Gilgamesh returns to Uruk, he washes the filth of battle from his hair and his body. He dons on a clean robe and cloak, wipes Humbaba's blood off his weapons, polishes then. Then he ties his hair back, sets a crown on his head. He looks so splendid that Ishtar, the goddess of love and war, Interesting how this goes together in all the stories. Love and war, life and death, white and black. She's overcome with lust. Anyway, she pleads with Gilgamesh to be her husband. She promised him a harvest of riches if he plants his seed in her body. She tells him that they will live together in a house made of cedar that she will give him a lapsus lasso chariot with golden wheels. She says that kings and princes will offer him all their wealth, but Gilgamesh refuses to be her toy in a very rude way as far as I'm concerned. But he says no. He has nothing to offer her in return since, as a goddess, she has everything she could ever want. He says that her desire for his body is fleeting and she will grow tired. She will lose interest. He tells her he knows what happened to her other human lovers. And they all learned how treacherous and cruel her heart and whims are. Now her husband, Tammuz, the shepherd, became a captive in the underworld and is mourned in festivals every year. Still to this day, another shepherd she loved became a broken-winged bird. She loved the lion, then ensured that he was captured in ambush pits. She loved the stallion, but contrived harness and whips and spurs to control him. When a goat herder loved her, she turned him into a wolf. When her father's gardener rejected her advances, she turned him into a frog, which, you know, goes to the frog prince story. Gilgamesh asked why he would fare any better. Gilgamesh means Gabriel is commander. Now, perhaps the biggest change that came from the initiation or the initiated version of the tarot, because that's what comes next, is the original Golden Dawn and its later offshoots, what they used. In that deck, the fool is represented as a naked child of indeterminate sex, which is well done, who is accompanied by a wolf 
on a leash who is reaching up for a rose in the garden or the golden dawn forgive me the fool represents the god Harpocrates Cretes I think the Egyptian god Horus as a young child again the four major magic symbols the scepter the cup the sword, the pentacle, the fool always carries them, although he has long since forgotten what they mean. Nevertheless, they belong to him, even though he does not know their use. The symbols have not lost their power. They retain it in and of themselves. One theory for its origin, and perhaps the most widely accepted, relates to the European transition from the Julian to the Gregorian calendar. In the Council of Trent, 1563, Pope Gregory the 13th issued a papal bull decreeing that Christian countries should adopt a new standardized calendar. Now, the initial accepted calendar in the Western world the Gregorian calendar has adopted was adopted due to its greater accuracy we were told compared to the Julian but one consequence of the transition however was that New Year's Day was removed from the 1st of April and moved to the 1st of January this is my month this is the first this is the first would it not be spring would spring not be the first of the year but anyway Let's not, you know, complain about that. And although resisted by Protestant countries in Europe, the new calendar was officially adopted by the Catholic states quickly. However, presenting the news of the transition across widely rural populations who were not actually Christianing at the time, much slower ta task. Supposedly, this was a particular problem following Francis' switch to the new calendar in 1582. People who continued to celebrate New Year at the end of March became targets for jokes and pranks and hoaxes. This included having paper fish attached to their backs and being called April fish in reference to their supposed gullibility. <laughs> I know. <laughs> we are reveling once again in ritual and post, in this post prosperity age, I guess. But we seem to follow the same thing. Now, I don't know, and I'm I'm sure it cannot be proven whether or not people think that they are holding some ancient beliefs. I think that we have been told what we used to believe, but we could have no idea. Now, if we go to America, one of the lingering legacies of the Puritan roots is mistrust and economic exploitation of holidays and festivals. It wasn't until the late 19th century that holidays like Christmas and Halloween and all the rest even became popular, even tolerated in most quarters. But there's still a strange sense of impropriety about it all as if we should feel guilty about the act of celebration, especially the April rituals, which were sexual. When we stopped, not everybody was cutting off everybody's genitals. <laughs> I think, I personally don't think that was happening everywhere. Now, in addition, our holidays have become a minefield of commercial exploitation, which, surprise, surprise, only continues to feed our alienation. Christmas has destroyed, been destroyed by commercialism. 
sectarianism. It needs a major makeover, like most of them do. We'll probably get some if the economy continues to tank much in the way it is. Now, given the current political climate, it would probably be some kind of genetic winter solstice festival, some safe place, Christianity. But what's more familiar than Christmas trappings? Cool ones, at least originally from what they were. All the roots of all the holidays are keyed to the rhythms of nature. This is what we keep in our heads. This is what you must focus on. The rhythm of nature. Because nature does have a rhythm. It's completely divorced from ourselves and our denatured existence. But there are signs of change even now. A lot of this bleed over from the gay community. A lot of it's coming from neo-pagan and goth communities. You also have in the equivalent holidays slash pilgrimages to convention circuits and different fan communities as well. There is no reason to feel strange about these things. There is no reason to not celebrate. Do you not think we could use more celebrating? I do, myself. I think that we should be celebrating daily because the things that are going on are too grim, far too grim. So let's go back to prophecy with Minimal speculation, I promise. <laughs> I will try. Again, to just eliminate what? What do they call it again? That luck is unpunished naivete. I find no reason that we should be ashamed even a little bit of what's going on. I don't. It's happened before, it'll happen again, and things are always the way they should be. There will be some of us to survive this change, and we are already working at it. I'm sure that the people of this planet want to live, that not everybody hates everybody else. We could not. How could we? So known as the fool, I would rather be a fool than believe this ends like this. And while the dance seems to be that of random nature, in fact, this dance is intricate. Fools must be the smartest one. I was reminded from the recent Michael Tessarian Red Ice interview that he mentioned that royal courts had a fool or court jester, usually as a liaison, usually the smartest one in the room, a representative of royalty to deceive the populace sometimes or actually to sit and give wise advice. Noting a modern interpretation of a politician or a frontman for the powers, this is the kind of fool that they are playing. In context, though, it's disconcerting that presidents actually met with, Obama met with Queen Elizabeth II on April Fool's Day. Was he the fool at that time? Well, we know who we have. We have a trump card. So, again, it's a fool. As Stara, the spring equinox in March focuses on his balance of light and dark. But at this point on the wheel, light is triumphant and the days become longer than the nights, paying homage to new light. 
Ostara, like cultural Easter holiday, brings grasses and chicks and eggs into our life to demonstrate the exuberant power of fresh beginnings. With the spring equinox, we find the energy and the freshness in ourselves to burst of the dark egg of the winter inactivity. We celebrate all of the abundance, all of the evidence of life, continuation with joy. We should celebrate these moments and at the first sight of green, we should cheer. The so-called Easter lily was once the floral emblem of the goddess Juno in a virgin aspect and of the spring goddess who was her northern counterpart, Ostar, whose name gave us Easter. Worshippers of the great goddess insisted that the world's first lily sprang from the milk of her breast. Easter Bunny began with the pagan festival of springtime goddess, Ostar, of course, when it was said that the moon hair, now the hair on the moon was the one, actually the Chinese have the same one, but the hair on the moon, like rabbit, the rabbit on the moon was making immortality elixirs, the elixirs of immortality, the forever life. We talked about that before, but still the same, same one. And he's on the moon once again. Now the Easter Bunny. I don't know. These eggs probably have more to do because eggs usually represent the human soul. But the eating of an egg may have represented as well the, the spells and the potions of immortality. Oster's hair was the shape that the cell, Celts imagined that the surface of the full moon was derived from an old Indo-European source, I guess, hot cross buns, which I love, and will only eat at Easter, I don't even know. They were actually the traditional Easter cakes throughout the Middle Ages. Another inheritance from something much older, the cross. Well, the cross is the chi ro. It is actually a sign of a P, but never mind. It looks like a P and a T together. It's, it's okay. I don't mind what we've done with it, really. But the cross marked them and later interpreted as a Christian symbol. But it was originally the Wotan cross. You guys got Wotan. That was your guy. Now, the bun itself, female symbolic. And associated, once again, goddess the star after whom the Easter festival was named April Oster month to the Anglo-Saxons, the Germans, the Franks, the goddess Ostar must have been one of the most highly regarded of the Teutonic deities. Her festival had been a very important one, deeply implanted in popular feelings. So throughout thoroughly was her worship totally annihilated, however, that we ha no longer know people what they thought of her. We'll be right back. You're listening to Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. Now, what we don't know, again, is about this goddess, because she was completely wiped out by Christianity, because, you know, it's a really big on um, hating women, this Christianity of the new, 
still ongoing, obviously. It's why the the um, Romans and the Greeks named all their viruses and dreaded diseases after women. They hated us. So we've been in trouble for a long time, girls, and we're still under the exact same rule. This is the weak do not thrive in this atmosphere. They never will. And what's going on was never meant to be good for everyone. Only some people were ever going to do well in this. So the roots of the goddess. Her festival, I think, was probably important, but we don't know. Little remains except her name. Christian's authorities carefully refrain from explaining that at Easter time. The goddess remained associated with wild woodlands, like fairy queens and wood nips of the Celtic tradition. Her priestesses became the wooder mayor, wood mothers, or little wood women, to whom buns or the dumplings were offered in some parts of Bavaria around Easter time. Now, when I noticed that April Fool's Day had begun with um, New Year's Day, the new year was used to begin in around April. The start of the new year was moved to January, but we are still celebrating the birth. It had nothing to do with anything Jesus did. The birth was about that stuff outside. The creation, the planet, which we actually used to um, be involved in, felt we used to actually know these things. We will know these things again. Everything keeps turning. It will return. Will it not? That's why it was called Foolish. April Fool's Day. Now again, birthday of Hathor. So keep a really close eye for Hathor references to pop up in world events. Sunco reference, Sun Fool, perhaps. Now, since the Zoroastrians celebrate their New Year's for two weeks, starting at the equinox, ending in early April, it's the New Rose, New Azul, now, Rus, depending on how I say it, festival. It is a 5,000 year old tradition. The Iranian American community is holding their Nuruz festival um, in a park, I think, last weekend. It's a pretty cool holiday. Now, I want to read you something that's all about this time. Do you guys remember this? Day after day alone on a hill, the man with the foolish grin is keeping perfectly still, but nobody wants to know him. They can see he's just a fool, as he never gets an answer. But the fool on the hill sees the sun going round, and the eyes in his head sees the world spinning round. Well, on the way, head in the cloud, man of a thousand voices talking perfectly loud and nobody ever hears him or the sound he appears to make no one ever seems to notice but the fool on the hill sees the sun going down and the eyes in his head see the world spinning round and no one seems to like him they can tell what he wants to do no one ev never shows his feelings. But the fool on the hill sees the world spinning round. The eyes in his head see the world spinning round. He never listens to them. He knows that they're the fools. He don't like, they don't like him, the fool on the hill. 
sees the sun spinning round, and the eyes in his head see the world spinning round. <laughs> Do you remember that one? One of my favorites. And it's often interpreted that the fool in the tarot deck is also associated with Uranus. Prior to the discovery of Uranus, Saturn marked the boundary of the known universe. Uranus coincided with some of the major breakthroughs of the 20th century, including space travel, allegedly. This is the planet of change, which is most times and most often completely unexpected and never happens the way you thought. This is the fragility of things. Now consider Uranus to be a rebel, to upend the existing paradigms and the norms. But the process is inevitable. It cannot be stopped and Uranus won't quit until it is done. Uranus is the ruler of the Aquarius sun sign in astrology. Aquarius is the 11th sign of the Western Zodiac. Now, on April 1st, this time at 2 a.m., the moon formed a challenging square to Uranus. This is why I was talking about the circle, circling the square. This probably will affect your personal chart. Dreams will be very revealing in this cycle. Pay attention to what's going on. Now, there's a highly esoteric opera called Percival. Percival. Which is about the purest fool who becomes the perfect knight. It seems highly significant to this topic as well this time of year and this now. I say this now because I don't believe in past and present and future must, much like most people do. I think everything that has ever happened and will ever happen is happening exactly at this time right now. That all things are happening together. It's why your dreams are probably kind of strange right now. It's like you're remembering something or seeing the future, but you can't tell which. Just hold that in your head and know that you're okay. It's significant to this topic and although the best known for composing the planets, Gustav Holst wrote this article called The Perfect Fool. It's satirical tribute to Parsifal. His other works and interests are also worth noting for the reference to this, these secret topics and the topics that I've we talk about a lot. Further interests, I guess, in this are articles about the planets themselves as well as the hymn, the hymns of Jesus. Have you guys heard that? Oh, you haven't? Okay, let me talk, let me talk to you about the hymn of Jesus. It's kind of interesting. Now again, same author. It's Gnostic exploration of time and space, believe it or not. This essay originally appeared in Temple Magazine, 1999 issue. Bosian and Hawks, London. Now, when Holst arranged for these plain chants, to be sung in the original Latin versions. The meaning of the hymns would have been rendered obscure to all except specialists. It can be hardly doubted that his obscurity was deliberate. The presentation of Vexilla Regulus by a distant choir of, of um, troubles 
over an orchestra of independently oscillating high chords creates a feeling of agelessness, unknowable cosmic mystery. The device of two musical ideas surrounding simultaneously, moving at a different independent speed, it invites comparisons to many things. Suddenly, the listener is jolted back from the mundane world of suffering by a sharp, piercing chord of the orchestra. The musical, an indicator of pain, an intensification of it. It's somehow similar to the suffering motif of Parsifal, borrowing must be delivered. Many people thought highly of Parsifal. And I'll, I'll put some links up for it. It's interesting. Even going so far as to satirize it in this opera, this perfect fool, the perfect fool. In Wagner's opera, and Fortis, through his own sin, a king whose wounds will not heal. This motif has become a symbol for suffering humanity for our suffering the um, Wagnerian illusion must have been again intentional because he made well composed Saturn 1915 Holst had already written the original music evoking this intense anguish such a personal exploration of suffering would have been appropriate in the prelude, but host seems to want to suggest something else, that humanity as a whole is wounded immediately from a distant region. The panche lingua intoned in a choir of tenors and basses, their sound is distinctly conciliatory, ecclesiastical. They sing reassuring of an ultimate victory. Sing my tongue, the glorious battle. Sing the ending of the fray in similar soothing tones. The trombones under uttered this plain chant at the prelude opening. The second half of the half of the preludes adds in the atmosphere of unearthly resolution, celestial bliss. The bar's silence allows the listeners to absorb this experience. The end of the prelude, the G minor, the opening has begun to resolve, and the long dominant pedal towards C. At this point, we could have expected a meditation on the resurrection. But what follows is a Gnostic hymn of Jesus, which exhorts the listener not just to follow Jesus, but to understand why humanity suffers. Holst offers his audience hope to the spiritual, hence the affirmative, the confident, the daring setting, as far as known is the first ever made of a Gnostic text. A stroke host had cast aside. With this world, he threw away the Victorian, the Edwardian, the sentimental, and created a precursor of the kind of works that would be done not until the 1970s. And since the discovery of a large library of Gnostic texts and mystical gospels in Egypt at Nek Hammadi after World War II, we know for sure that the Gnostic Church offered coherent mystery alternative to the conventional Christianity based on ideas of faith and obedience interpreting it in symbolic terms, offering to unfold a secret doctrine that would lead to true, true spiritual knowledge, gnosis, 
This is hardly generally known. When Host was writing this hymn, very few Gnostic texts had been published. Very few had been studied. They're generally classed amongst the New Testament Apocrypha. However, one scholar actively engaged in making these texts better known was friendly with Host and had published an edition of the Gnostic Gospel, Peace de Sophia, The Testimony of Truth. And this was as early as 1896, so somebody knew something. <laughs> you know, in its original form, the hymn probably dated probably second century ish. Now, despite a call by Augustus or Augustine for its destruction in the fourth century, the Gnostic Christianity was looked at as heretical by the Greeks, by the Roman churches. Somehow, one single manuscript, one copy, managed to survive to this time. It was unearthed in the Imperial Library in Vienna, 1897, quickly published in the Cambridge University Press, the Apocrypha Antisodata, Part 2. For those who want to know, it's the fragrance of a faith forgotten. The answer seems to be that according to Mead, it was not a hymn at all in our sense of the word, but perhaps the earliest surviving true Christian, perhaps pre-Christian mystery ritual. It appeared that Host was similar and familiar with the Vedas that he had treated the works of his Indian period that the message was still getting through at a time where people were suffering. Do you remember the movie Knowing? This brings it up. What we know gets in the way of us truly knowing. To become the perfect knight, one must first become the fool. To carry on your own way, alone, with abandon, ignoring the stumbling blocks, the pitfalls, the warnings that have been placed in your path, barking voices of everyone else that will tell you you are a fool for doing so. This is the zero. This is the oneness, perfect, complete, indivisible, within itself, all-encompassing, everything and no thing. It is all. We see the vague concept symbolically winking at us every time we touch our fingers to the keyboard. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero. Isn't it weird how it all just ties together? All this information out there, yet most people don't even realize the significance of it all. The thing I constantly am struck by is how all of this ancient fertility stuff is reemerging as we become technocrats and divorced from nature itself. It's a good start to connect some of those dots. And when you read stories like scientists believing that life was seeded to Earth, from Ceres, asteroid, Ceres, Demeter, Isis, Sybil. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? Somewhat along the same lines, fathering, following the view of the fool, no longer owning the knowledge of the symbolism that he carries at today's G20 protests, a group making big shine is the space hijackers. They're very interesting. Their choice of transportation is a mock police tank. 
they are all carrying pillows to fight the batons of the bobbies. Some call them fools in this sense. But they know what they are doing. They are playing out at the state symbols, nicely synced up with this important day as well, didn't it? And for our living cosmos, the evolution of Earth, of life on Earth, has clearly been influenced by impacts from space stuff. The solar system is part of the larger cosmic environment. We are the hallucination. We are of earth and sky. The sun is, the sun is a very steady star. But even small variations have substantial effect on the climate, on us. When the sun catches cold, the earth sneezes. And since astrobiology is one of my favorite things, We keep these things. The fertility symbolism is rising up, unbidden <laughs> or not. We've seen lots of it. And that we've kind of seen this coming this whole time. The Ka Bi Nasan. Or you can say Ha Bi Nasan. It's the first of April. April. The Rasha Dishata, the head of the year. This is in Syrian, and I have to apologize to anyone Syrian because I'm sure I just butchered that. Also known as Aktu, or the Assyrian New Year, too. The Spring Festival amongst the Assyrians celebrated April 1st. Celebrations include the same things, parades and parties, and men and women wearing costumes dancing all night, dancing for hours. We have the Aktu festival, one of the oldest recorded religious festivals on this earth, celebrated for several millennia amongst the ancient Mesopotamia, yet Akitu was more than just a religious ceremony. It was acted out as a political device employed by the monarchy or the central priesthood to ensure supremacy of the king, the god nation, the national god, and its principal city. The politics and religion have always walked hand in hand since Mesopotamia, irrevocably in intertwined. Myths and their supportive rituals justified social institutions legitimize rulers. A Kitu festival was a tool wielded by the monarchy and the ruling class to promote state ideas. The Akitu festival demonstrates the effectiveness of religion as a political tool. Lots and lots of fools dancing around the cities now. Mostly with the best intentions, of course, hating the Fall Guys. <laughs> then we have Hugh Jackson, only has $17 to gamble with Gambit in the new Wolf Wolverine movie. <laughs> Made me laugh. Spring. You know not. All the ways are lawful to innocence, purely folly to the king of intuition. Silence breaks into rapture. Be neither man nor woman, but both in one. Be silent, babe, in the egg of blue, that thou mayest grow. Bear the lance and the grail. Wander alone and sing in the king's palace. His daughter awaits thee. Have a nice week, everyone. Bye for now.
Thank you for listening to Revolution Radio.